Um, I'm Anna Locke. I lead wo uh, the work on uh, land, water, and climate here at ODI. And um, we are delighted to have Professor Lord Stern here with us um, this afternoon um, for a conversation with our executive director, Kevin Watkins, um, to discuss um, the, the forthcoming negotiations on climate in Paris. So please do tweet about the event. Um, the hashtag is meant, to, yep, the hashtag is up there if you want to use that. Um, and then before I, I hand over to Kevin, I just wanted to make a few introductory um, remarks about why we're, we're here today. Um, as you all know, leaders will be meeting in around two weeks' time in Paris to um, discuss um, sorry, <coughs> um, for the Conference of Parties. So this is a yearly UN conference on, on climate change to discuss um, what progress has been made on, on climate change. Now, this one is the 21st one. It is a particularly important one because for the first time in over 20 years, uh, countries are coming together to um, try to achieve a legally binding and universal agreement on climate with the aim of keeping global warming to um, below two degrees centigrade. Now, um, this is a critical moment for climate negotiations, and it is also you know, critical for countries in the developing world who are already feeling the impact of the problems that climate is, is bringing. And um, it's, it's critical to think about several things. Um, we have set a very ambitious target for poverty reduction, so we're trying to achieve zero poverty by 2030. And there is a danger that unless we reach um, an ambitious deal at Paris that not only will we not meet that target, but the substantial gains in poverty reduction that we have achieved over the years will be reversed. But alongside achieving an, an ambitious deal, we also need very practical strategies um, to transition to a path um, towards low carbon, climate resilient growth. And I'd like to just discuss some of the work that we've been doing here um, at ODI to work on some of the most critical challenges facing that transition. So one of them is to look at the energy transitions that are needed to achieve zero net emissions while reducing energy poverty. So we've been doing some work at looking to what extent tweaking the existing mod model of generating and delivering energy um, is sufficient to achieve that. And our findings are that tweaking that model with things like cleaner coal just won't do it. We've got to do something much more radical. But other parts of our work, and you can see it on the leaflet, our work on fossil fuel subsidies, shows just to what extent the perverse incentives exist um, for maintaining business as usual. And without um, changing that, we won't be able to achieve what we need to achieve. Now, we do know that climate risks are borne disproportionately by the, the poorest, and we do a lot of work looking across agriculture, water, cities, um, to get a, a sense of what the climate risks are facing the poorest people and how best we can, um, they, they can be managed. And then finally, to actually achieve that transition, we need to look at the resources that are going to be allocated to that. And we have a climate finance team that works on looking how best to achieve that at international and national level um, to fund that transition. Now, we will, at, at ODI, be in Paris. Uh, we've got people participating on panels at side events, moderators, discussants, um, and we're also co-organizing a two-day event, Climate Development and Climate Days, on the 5th and 6th of December, where we bring together the development and climate communities who lead surprisingly separate lives to discuss these issues. So if you're interested, please look at the leaflet. There's, there are details on the, um, on the back about that or talk to one of our team to get any, any more information. And now if I come to the reason that you, all you are here, um, <laughs> which is to hear Lord Stern um, speak, I would um, really like to welcome Lord Stern. We know that he has an incredibly packed schedule, particularly leading up to Paris. Um, and I don't think I really need to, to introduce him um, because he is one of the world's leading experts on climate change. And for me, he really stands out as one of the, uh, as the person who really brought economics into the heart of the discussion on climate change and therefore radically changed the, the potential for us dealing 
you know, understanding the climate changes and, and dealing with them. Um, so, Professor, Professor Lord Stern, sorry, you've got so many titles. <laughs> so, um, I have a name. You have a name, Nicholas, yeah, Nick, Nick, Nick Stern. Nick. <laughs> we are delighted that you're here, and we really look forward to your insights into what you think can or should be achieved at Paris and beyond. So I will now hand over to Kevin. Um, there will be plenty of time at the end of the discussion for questions and answers, but over to you, Kevin. Thanks very much, Anna. And, and Nick, it's uh, wonderful to have you in, in ODI. I, actually, there, there were two very brief remarks I wanted to make in addition to Anna's point that um, <clears throat> over the past couple of years, Nick has been very actively involved in the uh, new climate economy in the, in the, the Global Commission which he co-chairs with uh, Felipe Calderon, the former president of Mexico. And we're absolutely delighted, actually, that we, we, we actually host part of NCE here at ODI now, it is, and it's great to have them here. And the, and the second one is a, is, a, is a personal one, actually, because I, I sort of feel I've known Nick for 40 years or something. It, it, it's not 40 years, but uh, I, I first read about the work your work when you were working with Peter Lanjau in um, in India on the, the the studies of the villages, the name of which I forget, Palampur. 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 You didn't <laughs> um, but I I, th I think you've always had this extraordinary ability to combine macroeconomics, including your thinking about climate, with real world poverty and inequality issues, which is an extraordinary contribution, actually, for which I think we're all very grateful to to you for. But. Um, I, I wanted to maybe just to get the ball rolling by getting a take from you of how you feel the politics of climate change have shifted over recent years. Now, I was saying to you when we, was sitting, when we were talking before that uh, I, I, I read a piece, reread a piece that you wrote in The Guardian just after Copenhagen. And you, you, you even managed to be optimistic, actually, after Copenhagen, but I, I think it would be interesting for us to get a, your general sense on how you feel the old north-south north dichotomies are shifting and how the politics are, are changing in the run-up to Paris. Thank you very much, Kevin, and, and thank you for reading um, old newspaper columns uh, of, of mine. Um, and You should know that for transparency, Kevin and I have been uh, interacting on and, and largely agreeing uh, on many of the big issues around um, development and poverty reduction um, for a number of decades, including when uh, I was chief economist of the World Bank, this was a dozen or so years ago, and he was the policy director of Oxfam. And uh, then as a World Bank official international civil servant, um, consorting with civil society was deemed to be a good thing. Um, but the policy director of Oxfam to meet with the chief economist of the World Bank was considered... Um, uh, consorting with uh, the great Satan. So mm -hmm. I was enormously grateful for Kevin's friendship to continue through these social barriers and we continued to uh, interact at those times. So uh, that's a test of how much we like talking to each other. Um, but you asked about how things have changed in the last six years since Copenhagen. And I think Copenhagen was the last of the old encounters, old in the sense that uh, we saw uh, or still respected the sharp division that came from the, uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change originally in 92 and through Kyoto in 97 of the division into the developing world and the rich world. Uh, at the time of uh, Rio and, uh, and um, uh, 1992, it was probably, and the, these figures are rough, but it's probably the case that two-thirds of the emissions came from the rich countries. You know, it's a very small faction, maybe one billion out of six billion people. They had two-thirds of the emissions. Now, of course, there's still many more people in the developing world, um, perhaps six billion out of the seven billion in the developing world, but their emissions are now approaching two-thirds uh, of the total emissions. So that's a measure of the change, and that changes for the entirely a happy reason that the developing world and emerging market has grown faster than the rich world, which is a good thing. But it's had this uh, uh, effect of changing the ways in which um, we have to understand the problem. So it's quite clear now that you couldn't re rely on just the rich countries to do all the heavy lifting. 
they have an enormous responsibility to act strongly and quickly, uh, more strongly and more quickly, uh, because of their emissions per capita and because of uh, their responsibility for past emissions. But this is absolutely not going to work until, unless everybody's together. And one of the important things that happened since Copenhagen is that that has been recognized. And we'll have an agreement which treats the uh, uh, commitments, pledges, responsibilities, contributions, whatever you call them, of all countries in a similar way. But there is still correctly an expectation that the rich countries will act uh, strongly and quickly, that they'll set good examples, that they'll share those examples, and they'll give financial support. Those things matter, and they continue to matter. But the first change is the coming together, and it's a big change. And it was essentially uh, recognized explicitly two years after Copenhagen uh, in, in Durban. Um, the spirit in Cancun one year after Copenhagen was also uh, very strong, and you can argue that the, uh, uh, in, this, in this sense, um, Copenhagen was a rather successful failure in the sense that uh, the Copenhagen Accord was the basis of the Cancun Agreement, beautifully put together by Felipe Calderon, the president of Mexico, um, and uh, Patricia Espinosa, the foreign minister. Um, and what happened was that after Copenhagen, countries would said they would give their emissions plans for 2020 uh, in the January, January 2010, after Copenhagen, and they did in large measure. So that Copenhagen and, and then Durban was a very important change, and uh, the politics absolutely have changed um, in response to the realities of where output is and where emissions come from. Um, a further very important change is that now United States and China are coming together. Um, China has now uh, doubled the emissions of United States total. I mean, its population is four times as high, but uh, and uh, China's emissions per capita are about the same as the EU. So China is absolutely central. If there's one country that's central to all this, it's China. I've been working in China since 1988, uh, an honorary professor at the People's University. And the change in China over the last five years or so is quite striking. They have recognized the magnitude of the problem. They've recognized the importance of uh, air pollution. They've recognized not only the magnitude of the problem, but how big they are, not only in their own emissions, but also in that other people will look to them. And they've recognized that they have great potential in uh, winning the green race. And if uh, that's the kind of race they win, then good luck. Good luck to them. That's exactly the kind of competition that uh, we need and want. So that change in, in uh, China has been absolutely fundamental, extremely serious, founded on understanding of the science, founded on an understanding of the risks that they face, founded on an understanding of the air pollution and of what's needed technologically. And, and Nick, before we go on to Paris, what about um, India? Well, um, India's changing, but remember that its emissions per capita uh, are probably about roughly speaking, two tons CO2 equivalent, whereas China and Europe are nine or 10 CO2 equivalent tons per capita, United States about 20. So India feels that, uh, understandably, that uh, their emissions are still at a very low level. But India is set to grow pretty strongly over the next 20 years. Actually, we all hope that India is set to grow pretty strongly. They have tremendously big uh, solar emissions. I think if I remember for 2022 it's ballpark 170 something uh, gigawatts of solar which is not far away from the total solar in the world now. Yeah, That's a huge ambition. Unfortunately uh, there's also a very big ambition in coal. So what India does in expanding coal is extremely important to uh, what happens next. So collaboration with India on technology, collaboration with India on bringing down the cost of capital. Uh, and of course, cost of capital is extremely important for renewables because they're much more capital intensive. I mean, their running cost, I mean, their input cost of its solar is zero, right? That comes from the sun. But so it's nearly all capital equipment. And uh, there, the cost of capital is extremely important to the competitiveness of these. So 
India uh, is not yet huge in this game, but it's becoming so very quickly in terms of emissions. How that happens is of uh, vital importance. Okay. Let's move on to Paris. Yeah. <laughs> so there's one interpretation of Paris, you know, from people who are on the pessimistic side, might be that you, if you look at the uh, INDCs that are on the table, they leave us a long way from where we need to be, you know, probably with 55 gigatons around 2030 rather than 35 to 40, which means we're off track for two degrees and probably closer to three degrees. Um, and it's not going to be legally binding, some people would argue. So this is a prescription for failure, might be one take of where we're heading for Paris. And I'd, I'd be interested in your, your take on that. I have a great friend called Jan Artus Bertrand who, who produced uh, this wonderful book, The Earth's From Above, and a, a great movie called Home about the environment and so on. He just produced another great movie called Human. Um, and when asked this question, Jan says it's too late to be pessimistic. And um, I, I can see what he means. Um, it, essentially, uh, as you described it, Kevin, is absolutely correct. Uh, we're about 50 billion tonnes CO2 equivalent now, world total global emissions. And if you add up, and we've been doing this fairly consistently over the last nine months or so at the LSE, uh, where you think people are going, it hasn't changed all that much in the last nine months. It, it looks around um, 55 billion tonnes CO2 equivalent in 2030. So going up about 10% or so, um, when we should be going down from 50 to 40-ish, should be going down 20% or so for what would look like a reasonable two-degree path from here. Remembering that when you say a two-degree path, you have to say with a 50% probability or a two-thirds percent probability. So that uh, is an indication, or it's a measure, if you like, of the extent to which we're off a two-degree path. You can't, of course, just look at 2030 and say this is a that number of degree path or that number of degree path, because you're lots. What really matters is what you do after 2030, and I hope we get to discuss that. But it's quite clear that um, we will be going up for another 10 or 15 years, when we should be going down pretty quickly for a two-degree path. But I do not. I do not conclude from that, and it would be wrong and uh, deeply destructive, actually, in my view, to claim that Paris is a failure because of that. Uh, essentially, you have got people coming together. There are very substantial reductions embodied in those INDCs um, relative to anything like business as usual. I mean, it's a difficult concept, but let's use it anyway. Um, so people have come together as 100 and 90 countries, 160 of them already have their, or more, have their INDCs. That's a coming together. The numbers that they come up with are significant reductions from business as usual. Those are good things. The discussions around collaboration on technology and financial flows may be less than we would wish, but they're also moving in a good direction. So we should recognize that, but at the same time recognize the gap that you and I and others have drawn attention to between what's on offer for 2030 and what should be on offer if two degrees was really uh, driving us in a powerful way. So recognize the positives, recognize the gap, and you immediately have the main question about Paris, which is the road from Paris. And that is, are we going to accelerate down that road? Having turned, if you like, having reached a genuine turning point, uh, in terms of people coming together and their ambitions. How are we going to accelerate? Will we accelerate? That's where the discussion should be. That, uh, and the answer to that question at the moment is partial, but it's, sub it's substantive, which is we're going to review and exchange ideas every five years, see whether we can bump it upwards as a result of learning from experience, learning from other people's experience. We should be investing very strongly in, uh, in innovation, we should be thinking about coalitions of, of cities and businesses and NGOs and so on. So we should be thinking about how to accelerate from Paris and encouraging those talking in Paris, both formally in the negotiations and outside, to focus on the acceleration away from Paris and the road from Paris. But let, let's, um, let's move on 
to that because you you've called for um, an industrial revolution in energy, and you know that that obviously implies an economic revolution as well in the way that we think about energy and pricing and incentives and investment. And I guess the you know the the the, the big question to my mind that comes out of Paris is that you know whatever the commitments say on paper if you look at some of the real world economics that are going on in this country as well of actually withdrawing incentives from renewable energy of you know across the world government still investing incredibly heavily in fossil fuel uh, exploration and, and exploitation it, I mean how do you see the sort of the the alignment of the economics of climate change and the transition for a green economy with the politics of what's going on in Paris? I'll come to UK in just a moment, but worldwide it's uh, moving in uh, the right direction, but, and it, it's a refrain that runs right through our discussions, not fast enough, but it's, uh, it's moving in the right direction. The most important change is China. Uh, the, China is now twice as big as the US, as I, I mentioned, in terms of total emissions, similar emissions per capita to Europe. It's still an economy that's growing quickly, and most of us who think about these things, not, not everybody, think that China is likely to grow at 5% or so for the next 15 years or so. There'll be ups and downs, but probably around that level. So it's a very big economy and uh, growing fast relative to the world, although not fast relative to what it was used to. So that's why it's so important overwhelmingly important. It's also overwhelmingly important in terms of other people looking to China. So my first answer to the question of is policy going in a good direction is to look at China and say yes. China has probably peaked coal. I think if you'd asked us five years ago would China have peaked coal uh, five years from now most of us would say no. Uh, I'm on record as suggesting that China could well be peaking its emissions in 2025 or earlier, a good deal earlier than the 2030 it's promised for, or well, is embodied, uh, be careful with words like promise, but it's embodied in its uh, pledges um, for, for Paris. So they are changing very rapidly. They're targeting 85% of electricity uh, outside fossil fuels by 2050. Uh, that would get it close to being on track for what we, the world would need. Um, that is a, a story which is of enormous importance, uh, taking their carbon markets uh, worldwide in uh, a couple of years, uh, sorry, countrywide, taking its carbon markets countrywide um, a couple of years from now, investing very heavily in innovation. Um, United States, um, the second biggest uh, emitter, is really starting to use the Environment Protection Agency in a strong way, in a way that will probably survive the challenges from um, uh, uh, those trying to litigate against the decision that CO2 is a pollutant. So that gives a strong tool. Um, you've got many states in the United States which are growing strongly and reducing emissions, like uh, California under Governor Jerry Brown. And Jerry Brown got re-elected with almost a 60% of the electorate on a program that included quite strong action. Many US firms taking this enormously seriously as well. So those are the biggest ones. We've already discussed India. Um, so what about Europe and, and the UK? Well, Europe's got the target of 40% reductions 1990 to 2030. I believe that Europe could do very well by increasing those. And one of my hopes, and I, I'm not alone, of course, in this, is that five years after uh, Paris, at the very first of these meetings to review, Europe would say that actually we're going to up our ambition, this would be 2020, we're going to up our ambition for 2030. And what about the UK? I'm, you could, I'm, I'm, I've been going down in size in my uh, examples. Well, the, I mean, I, as a person interested in all this, I do discuss these things with uh, Amber Rudd and to some extent with George Osborne and uh, a little bit with David Cameron, I take seriously, uh, because it's the right thing to do, uh, I take seriously their commitment to carbon budgets. Our carbon budgets are organised around the UK reducing 80% 1990 to 2050. And we have a 50% target 
reduction for 2025. It's not just one single date, it's, the, it's for the period two years either side of 2025. We have a 50% reduction for that. The fifth carbon budget comes in at, um, well, it should be released by the Climate Change Committee next month. That fifth carbon budget and its acceptance by government, for me, is going to be the key test. We're probably on track for 50% reductions 1990 to uh, 2025 helped by the fact that uh, we had loads of coal in 1990 and we've been phasing those out and the coal will, as Amber Rudd said a couple of days ago, uh, will be gone by 2025. Um, that's not cheating, that's a good thing. Um, but, of course, moving on from there, remember that your arithmetic, that if you're going down from 1 to point two and you go from one down to point five which is what we're talking about for 2025 for, to go from point five to two is another 60 percent reduction it's not you've done 50 percent you've got another 30 percent <laughs> to go you could remember the denominator right so um we will need uh, 2025 to 2050 60 percent reductions and uh in in just 25 years when we will have made 50% reductions in 35 years, 1990 to 2025. That's just arithmetic, nothing political there. But it's important arithmetic, because what we've got to do is put ourselves in the UK, not only to meet the 50% reductions by 2025, but to accelerate very <laughs> strongly from there uh, in, in just those next 25 years. That's why I think the fifth carbon budget is so important. We need a strong fifth carbon budget, and we need the government to accept it. That, for me, will be... And then they get there using whatever the policies uh, are. If there's going to be a lot of gas developed in the next um, 10 years, maybe there will. Um, if there is, we have to be very clear to the investors in gas that uh, the path to cutting emissions in the UK by 80% 1990 to 2050 will require the phasing out of that gas, certainly in the 2030s, or carbon capture and storage. What investors need, which, whether it's in renewables or gas or whatever, is clear signals. That signal has to be clear, not only through the carbon budget, but also in looking at the implications of the carbon budget, which is uh, 20 years but from now, me, phasing out the gas. Let, let, let me press you on that then, to go back to the politics of that, because you know, so the the carbon budget, I agree, is, is an in, encouraging story, as are many you know, many other developments that you've described. UK climate legislation is very good. Yeah, no, it's it's path it's path breaking legislation. But if you look at say, you know, going in reverse order from you, but starting in the UK, the, you know, there have been very significant ca tax concessions provided to North Sea oil investors in the, in the past year. Uh, China has been increasing subsidies and support for fossil fuel exploration in India and, and others. And in a way, this is pulling in the opposite direction of the processes that you're describing. Uh, and I guess the question I want to put to you is that, you know, we have you know, very strong evidence now, the annual reports from the IMF, we, d we do pretty much an annual report here on it as well, looking at the fiscal side, that somehow there's a gap between the political decisions that are being made and the economic incentives that are needed. And, I, and, and so the, the, the question for me is, you know, how, how do we shift the needle politically? Um, I think the first thing is to campaign against the explicit fossil fuel subsidies. Depending how you calculate them, I know you do these things, so does the IMF, so does the OECD, but five or six hundred billion dollars per annum direct consumption and production subsidies. And you've been very effective campaigners on that. It's extremely, so is the OECD, it, it's extremely important. They dwarf subsidies for um, renewables. But the second thing, and this is something that the IMF published uh, in the spring of this year, is the implicit subsidies. We give people the right to make the atmosphere filthy now in terms of air pollution and we let people largely for free 
emit greenhouse gases. Now, the air pollution now from burning fossil fuels kills people in the millions around the world now, and it kills people in the many millions in the future through climate change. We're letting people do something that's extremely costly for free. If we gave people costly labor for free, if we gave people costly land for free, we would call that a subsidy. Giving people the right to <coughs> tip rubbish into the atmosphere for free, in my book and the IMF's book, is a subsidy. You can call it an implicit subsidy, an indirect subsidy. I don't mind the adjective. It's still a subsidy. And those come in about 10 times the other figure. I mean, they, they come in about $5 trillion a year or so, and that's immense. So getting people to understand that. Just look at it through coal. Coal you can buy, um, you know, not the supermarket, but if you're in the business for coal in bulk, you can buy it at uh, $50 a tonne. I mean, it depends on the quality of coal, but let's just call it that. A coal burns... Um, I mean, it's just a physics and chemistry. I mean, the, the coal produces about 1.9 tonnes, if you burn it, CO2 equivalent. Price that at $35 a tonne, to keep the arithmetic simple, call the 1.92. So 2 times 35 is $70 a tonne. The $35 a tonne is the price that the, uh, they use in the United States, and it's the price that uh, emerged really from some modelling led by Mike Greenstone at the uh, Council of Economic Advisers, uh, using models that leave out most of the more worrying things about climate change. Like extreme weather event, you know the extreme weather events and uh, migration and you know, most, most a lot of the things that or most of the things that really matter. So uh, while I'm in print at arguing that thirty-five dollars a ton is much too low, let's keep it there. So you're fifty dollars a ton to buy it, another seventy dollars a ton for the uh, greenhouse gases CO two, and then if you take the IMF calculations on the damages from air pollution, you find that they're roughly twice using that price of carbon, too low of course, but using that price of carbon, the damages from air pollution are about double the uh, 70. So you've got 50 plus 70, 120, and then you've got another double the 70, which is another 140, that's 260. I think we can safely say buying coal and burning it, I mean, if you buy it and sort of make, um, you know, architecture out of it, that's a different thing, but if you buy it and burn it, you're talking about coal at $250 or so, surely over 200 Coal is extremely expensive. And we should be very clear that coal is an extremely expensive fuel unless you take the lives of your people at extremely low value. Now, if the leaders of their countries want to say coal is cheap because the value of lives of people in our country and, of course, elsewhere from climate change is cheap, they should say so. And they should defend that observation. Yeah? So what we're talking about here is moving from targets to policies and prices. And you can regulate away the coal. That's what we're doing here. And that's very good. Uh, I'm, I heartily welcome Amber Rudd's announcement a couple of days ago to phase out the coal here. But we should be phasing out the coal as far as we can everywhere. China's peaking. <coughs> we must all work together to help India to expand its uh, electricity uh, demands, industrial demands, in some other way. So I think that's, these are the areas where we should concentrate first on policies. But always, always bear in mind that we need serious amounts into innovation. Yeah. And we've been under-investing under as a world on energy innovation for a long time. So, <coughs> But the, the other point was about, should we be searching for more hydrocarbons? No, is the answer to that question. We, just look at the arithmetic. We can burn, depending on how you do the sums, but we can burn uh, at most probably half of the reserves that we already know about to have a reasonable chance of holding to two degrees. That is an entirely apolitical statement. That's taking the carbon content of that, those reserves, asking what happens if you burn it, calculating the CO2, and comparing that with the total emissions we've got left in order to hold below two degrees. It, it, it's basically physics, chemistry, plus arithmetic. And so if you, can, if you can only burn at most half of it, what's the point in uh, searching for more? Yeah. Now, 
get rid of, don't burn the coal first, and that gives you a little bit of a breathing space. But um, the right direction for exploration is down, and down fast. Okay, so I think there's some good advice there for the coal industry to look at boutique markets in the future rather than the <laughs> mass energy markets. <coughs> Nick, what, what I wanted to do, d d just um, to close very briefly on two aspects of the deal in Paris, because I, I want to leave time for questions for, for the audience. Um, one on climate finance. So the, you know, the 100 billion yeah. number <coughs> is one that has, you know, used political symbolic significance attached to it. And, and, I, and I know you've written more widely about the importance of looking at the, you know, the, the, the bigger infra infrastructure financing requirements for green transition. But, you know, the 100 billion story is still, still an important one in terms of the politics. And the second area is on um, adaptation, which, you know, if we were having this discussion in Africa, you know, I think many people would be, you know, deeply worried about the way that to some degree adaptation is being pushed a little bit to the margins of, um, of the negotiations. So, I, I mean, maybe if you could just close on what, what you see as the prospects for an ambitious deal in those two areas, and then we'll throw it open. Yeah. The, the $100 billion per annum by 2020 was negotiated at Copenhagen and embodied in the deal, which was more formal. Copenhagen was just an accord, a rather informal thing, but it was embodied in the understandings in the uh, global agreement in Cancun in December, um, it's COP16 in, in, in December of 2010. It's very close to home, actually. I, I negotiated it working with Prime Minister Meles Zenawi of Ethiopia um, with Mike Froman, who was working for Hillary Clinton, so it's very close to my heart. And we put in a hundred billion dollars a year um, public money and 50 billion dollars by 2015. <laughs> of course they deleted the 2015 and they took out the public. Um, at least we got the hundred, you know. We, uh, um, but uh, it, it was very important in getting the Copenhagen Accord and the Cancun uh, Agreement and it does matter. Now, it's not really being negotiated here because what we're negotiating here in Paris is for 2030. But it is important for trust that that which was seriously committed uh, in Copenhagen, Cancun, should be delivered. And the OECD uh, has done uh, some work uh, together with the Climate Policy Initiative uh, Institute um, and it looks as if those flows are of the order of uh, $60 billion a year now. Now, it's very hard to do those calculations because public money, you have to see, is it incremental? Uh, and that's always hard to know what people would have given had they never heard of climate change. And uh, the private money, you've got the additional problem that why is it going, who gets the credit for it going? And a developing country will say, if we've created the conditions where people want to come and invest in our country, particularly green, then we've done that. So um, you shouldn't credit it to you, the rich countries, instigating this action. So on the other hand, if a rich country backs, say, a feed-in tariff with uh, aid resources, and that leads to an investment, then it's fair, I think, reasonable to credit with the rich countries to having mobilized, at least played a role in mobilizing this private sector investment. So you get all kinds of agonizingly difficult judgmental decisions about counterfactuals in order to, to do this. But I think the OECD, CPI have gone about it in a reasonably sensible way. And uh, so I think we're probably en route to the 100 billion dollars, but I wish it had been public, and we wanted it that way at the time, but that's not the way it turned out. Um, for me, that matters, but there's a bigger issue, and it's the one you raised, and that perhaps in the question and answer we can talk a bit about the role of cities and infrastructure in all this, because they're fundamental. Um, those of you who want to hear more about cities, I'm talking at the Urban Age thing at the LSE uh, tonight, uh, 6.30 in the new academic building. Now, those of you in Spain or wherever you are can go quickly. Um, 
the next 20 years is going to see enormous movement into cities, very big building of energy infrastructure, as we were just discussing in uh, India. Our cities will probably go from around 3.5 billion people to about 6.5 billion people by mid-century, with their being fundamentally shaped in the next 20 years. So if you put the city's investment, you know, with all the transport and the water and so on with that, together with the energy story and investing in energy as many countries are moving through levels of income with quite strong energy demand, the world will probably increase its um, per annum investment on infrastructure from a bit over $3 trillion a year to $6 trillion and upwards. Now, it'll move upwards along that in the next 15 or 20 years. Um, for me, the big question is those trillions. How will they be financed? Will they be uh, clean and sustainable? That, the answer to that question is the answer to a discussion about the, where the world is going and whether the world will successfully manage climate change. That's the core. Those investments are the core of uh, action. So getting good policies, stable policies in place and bringing down the cost of capital are the fundamental elements of what climate finance should be discussing. I've been working with Amar Bhattacharya, you've got James Cameron here who spent a lifetime, professional lifetime working on this. J James Ridge over there is with us from the um, new climate economy, been working away on that. But for me that's the big story. And I think there's a tremendous amount we can do promoting the kind of policies that can induce the investment and bringing the right kind of finance forward. If you reduce the cost of capital from 6% real to 3% real, and in a world where governments are borrowing at 0% real, so it should be possible, if you could do that, you transform the scale of the infrastructure and you transform the capital intensity of the infrastructure because you make the renewables much more competitive. I mean, if you halve the cost of capital, you don't exactly halve the cost of renewables, but you're headed in that direction. So that which looks more or less competitive against the fossil fuels, with fossil fuels underpriced, of course, but that which already looks quite competitive would look extremely competitive if you brought down the cost of capital. So the climate finance is at the heart of those uh, increases from three to six trillion plus in the infrastructure and those investments are at the heart of the whole climate story which are is at the heart of the future of uh, humanity over this century okay nick what, what we'll do on the adaptation question i, I, I don't want to lose it but i'm conscious yeah, that I, I, should, I, I want to bring other people okay. in and i know there's at least one person in this room who's going to ask you about adaptation. <coughs> a question about adaptation yeah. so um so let, let me throw, throw it open. 